And let me welcome everyone who's joining us today for our, our Google Hangout. My name is Damon Wilson. I'm Executive Vice President here at the Atlantic Council in Washington. Uh, today's conversation is part of our programming on the crisis in Ukraine, we're, we're, something we have put front and center here at the Atlantic Council. Our guest today is Valentin Nalivachinko, the Director of Ukraine's uh, State Security Service, or the SBU. Um, we could hardly ask for a better uh, place guest to help us understand the Ukrainian government's perspective on the two-month-old confrontation with Russia that has seized the world's attentions. Director Nalivachinko is a longtime diplomat who served in his country's embassies here in Washington, as well as in Scandinavia. He served as Deputy Foreign Minister in 2006 as Ambassador to Belarus as well. After a career within the Foreign Ministry, uh, he left to join his country's security service, first as its Deputy Director, and then as its Director. He's been engaged in reforms to help give Ukraine's people greater access to classified government records on state persecution of the Ukrainians from the Soviet period. Um, Director Navalachinko was elected to Parliament in 2012 on the list of the Udar Party of Vitaly Klitschko. After the protests on the Maidan forced out President Viktor Yanukovych in February, the Parliament appointed Mr. Valachinko back to the position of Director of the SBU. He is now front and center at the conflict that is unfolding in Ukraine and in his country. As part of the SBU's responsibilities, one of their tasks is to be responsible for subversion within the country, within the borders of Ukraine. That is obviously a scenario I'm playing right now in eastern Ukraine. So with that, let me turn it over to you, to, to uh, our, Mr. Nalavelchenko, and ask you, um, what is your state of the situation? What is your assessment of what is happening in Ukraine's east right now? Our country, Ukraine, is now undergoing the very fragile situation after uh, Maidan, after the uh, actually previous corrupt regime of uh, Yanukovych. And all threats to national security are now concentrated in one area, which we actually understand as post-Maidan corruption. Absolutely non-readiness of many structures, law enforcement bodies, for uh, for instance, like uh, Ministry of Interior, local offices, uh, first of all, and others, including local offices and field offices of SBU as well, to actually protect uh, statehood security and to be ready to not allow subversive activity of Russian special services in our, in our, in our country. Plus, Damon, what is very important to understand is that for last, we now understand two or three years from Russia, especially in eastern Ukraine and in Crimea, they have, they have created very uh, covered but well structurized uh, networks with agents, with pro-Russian organizations uh, involving in such illegal activity many Ukrainians, local Ukrainians, and our main enemy towards our secure, national security and, and independence now in eastern Ukraine, especially in Donetsk and Lugansk Oblast, are those networks. And behind them, this is the third element, the third part of the puzzle, behind them are those GRU and other military officers from Russia or Russian military officers who are the main provocators and main organizers of uh, the, the, the all illegal uh, things happening, currently happening, especially in Slavyansk and in Kramatorsk, Donetsk Oblast. We have for sure, let's say, know now that who are they, I mean those Russian officers, they were very dangerous well armed, for years before prepared to do what they are doing now. And for last year, month, uh, half, uh, one and a half months, we as a security service uh, actually uh, managed to arrest and to detain 21 of them. 21 of them, I mean the agents, three officers of GRU, whom we, kept, uh, whom we keep in Kiev and uh, behind the bars, but still, in the region, up to 30, we uh, estimate up to 30 officers from uh, Russian military officers, and hundreds and hundreds of those whom I just mentioned to you, we call as uh, agents and network of these subvers subversive, uh, let's say, activity and uh, hostile activity uh, in Ukraine. What is very important to understand also that in these regions, Donetsk and Lugansk, 
this is true that uh, up to 30 percent of the population is very pro-Russian and constantly uh, they are for the last 20, 21 years under the Russian propaganda with TV channels, radio, all this uh, so-called uh, activity. And the ground, on the ground, real, uh, let's say, atmosphere, especially in uh, those poor regions, and they are very poor, I mean Donetsk and Lugansk, both regions, with the high level of un unemployment. There are many people, that's true, hundreds, uh, sometimes even thousands, who are very, whom are very easy to engage in such pro-Russian activity, whom are being used by those provocateurs, paying money in cash, uh, getting them uh, announcing whatever uh, political or so-called political slogans, referendum, so federa federation, uh, whatever else, and many, many of them come to the uh, quite in short time come to the place, to the scene, and become protesters. And that is, uh, to understand, that is the main difficulty for us, for uh, counterintelligence and counterterrorism and say service, to conduct real uh, counterterrorist operation. So many civilians are truly on the, on the scene, are truly on the, uh, at the place. Some of them again are, let's say, paid for, some of them not. But local communities, especially Slavyansk and Kromatorsk, are still, are still with those, uh, those criminals and still with those uh, Russian military uh, officers. In other places of Donetsk or Lugansk, the situation is different because of uh, not so high, let's say, level of the population, not so, not so high uh, quantity of people, uh, uh, number of people are, let's say, supporting such uh, radical and, uh, in some even cases, terrorist activity of uh, Russian armed groups. But in Slavyansk and Kromatorsk, Donetsk, Olvas, the situation is really serious and very complicated so far. So let me just ask you, uh, we have a question in from Warren, Warren Strobel with Reuters. Um, do you have a sense, given you've talked about the infiltration, the penetration uh, in the East, how many Russian special forces do you estimate are actually operating inside southeastern Ukraine as opposed to local uh, folks that have been recruited locally? And what, what kind of evidence do you have that they're there more than just in ones and twos, but that there's a more significant uh, Russian special forces presence in southeast uh, Ukraine? According to our, let's say, uh, evidences, we know for sure that up to 30 uh, those uh, special GRU and other military officers in Slavyansk and Donetsk, this is one part of Donetsk Oblast. All around Donetsk Oblast, we, we estimate them up to 100. But again, they are not alone, they are hiring, paying money for local, for local criminals and others who are actively involved in uh, armed and uh, let's say very dangerous uh, criminal activity with them and being guiding, uh, guided by them, I mean uh, Russian officers. So uh, this is for the Donetsk Oblast, our let's say, estimation. What evidences? I, I mentioned to you that we have detained uh, three of them, GRU officers, and they are being interviewed here in Kyiv and they gave us very uh, important uh, information and uh, evidences, according to, the, to, to which we actually now ready even to say for sure and to identify two main organizers with the names, their ranks, all personal data, and we already released this information and we already really, uh, say launched a criminal investigation against two, uh, let's say, identified organizers. Both of them are GRU officers, both of them we have asked Interpol as well to be aware and to be ready to detain them as soon as they will, whatever, appear in any other country. But for us now in Donetsk Oblast and in Ukraine, the main uh, task is to isolate and to stop the most dangerous and hostile activity of these two gentlemen. 
So uh, I've got quite a few questions that have come in already from the media, but let me just remind those viewers uh, that want to continue to submit. They can email questions to press at atlanticcouncil.org. Um, let me turn next, if, if you don't mind, Mr. Nalivalchenko, to a question from Karen DeYoung with the Washington Post. Um, she's heard that there are reports from Luhansk that indicate the very well-armed group of Afghanistan veterans are holed up with grenades in an yeah. SBU building there. Um, who are these men, and what do you know about them? What's the situation there? That's, uh, in Lugansk, in Lugansk uh, situation is a little bit different. That's true that up to seven, eight groups of people uh, in Lugansk, and mostly uh, they are veterans of Afghanistan, some of them uh, former military, let's say, special forces, Ukrainian special forces, or Soviet, uh, from Soviet times. Some of them are young people, radical organizations, and other groups are pro-Russian activists. So the mixture of uh, these different uh, groups are, are captured and seized the, the, the administrative building of SBU local office. That's true. And they are still in. But the situation, as I mentioned to you, is different comparing to Donetsk Oblast. Different because they are more or less not so hostile they are not uh, terrorizing at least the local community and they are not uh, conducting crimes or taking co hostages every day like it's uh, happening all, uh, currently in Donetsk Oblast in Slovyansk. Even more, more we can say that some of these radical groups in Slovyansk, we are talking to them constantly where we would like to, uh, and we are also communicating to other, let's say, uh, members of these organizations, uh, convincing them to stop illegal activity and to uh, leave and actually to vacate the building and to be protected by the uh, amnesty law which is ready which is ready by or being uh, be pre being prepared by the parliament of ukraine for, to let those young people who from different organizations uh, like civic organization even pro russian organization not to be prosecuted if they give up uh, weapons if they vacate the administrative buildings and so far, so on. So Lugansk is like that. So what, help us understand the distinction. When we had our last uh, webcast conversation uh, with your counterpart at the National Security and Defense Council, Andrew Powderby, he laid out Ukrainian uh, knowledge of a Russian plan, the Russian Spring, that actually covered eight oblasts uh, from Odessa uh, up to Kharkiv, including obviously Donetsk and Lugansk. Um, you're seeing most of this uh, development right now in, in Donetsk. What speaks to the differentiation? Are you concerned? Do you see this permeating uh, other oblasts? Uh, how, what, what explains the differences between what we're seeing on the ground in Donetsk versus other oblasts? Damon, actually to understand the, 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 the retrospective of the, of the situ current situation, it's true that in March, Russian, uh, Russian Federation really launched with uh, using mostly pro-Russian civic organizations launched first, uh, let's say, operation, they call it Russian Spring. But due to the activity of security service, we have detained, we have stopped activity, and according to the decision of Ukrainian courts, 29 people, so-called uh, separatists and their leaders, were, let's say, uh, the court decided to apply, uh, to keep, keep them in custody. So the first stage were stopped by these measures, by the decision of Ukrainian courts and by the uh, activity of the security service. As this stage failed, the next stage began. And this uh, stage is more dangerous, and as I mentioned several times to you and our, let's say, uh, dear colleagues uh, who hear us, um, that this is the paramilitary stage. This in most, uh, in, in some cases, even military and terrorist activities. So uh, simply, we we have managed to stop the first uh, wave and the first stage, but the most, in, let's say, uh, dangerous uh, stage, the, the the second stage, already begun. Immediately after the way they failed with the so-called eight oblast Russian Spring. Uh, separatist uh, and pro-Russian uh, organizations activities. So, so far that is why uh, the um, terrorists and, 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 and those uh, military people are doing what they are doing. They are provoking and undermining 
uh, all possibilities to resolve the crisis peacefully. And here is the place to mention Geneva Accords and agreements. We do think uh, in security services well of Ukraine that these accords are very important. And we are ready to cooperate uh, starting yesterday with OSCE uh, monitoring mission, special mission. Uh, today morning I have met with the members of OC mission here in Kyiv and we are ready to extend their mandate and our cooperation uh, in Donetsk and Slovyansk as well with our special representatives and special uh, troops there. We are ready to provide all evidences we are collecting every day and to give uh, full success to uh, full, excuse me, full access to all materials and actual operational, even sometimes, information we will get. So that is uh, how we see the importance of uh, Geneva uh, agreements and the mission and mandate of OSC uh, monitoring mission. Plus, I think it is very important to finally, as uh, Vice President Biden mentioned today in Kyiv, to hear and to see from Russia at least one step towards the, the, the uh, actually uh, implementation of Geneva agreements, especially regarding the disarmament or de-weaponizing of uh, those paramilitary and military people in Donetsk Oblast, uh, to vacate uh, administrative buildings and to start real process of de-escalation of the situation. So we have a related question from our own uh, Irene Halupa, um, formerly of RFERL, just about that, about Geneva. I mean, what, given what you just said, what is the prospect? Do you have counterparts? Um, who will uh, make the, uh, the, the, the demonstrators, the armed demonstrators in Donetsk, adhere to the terms of the Geneva Accords? You see Lavrov actually blaming uh, Ukraine for not being able to maintain order, uh, and yet we're hearing from you about the Russian hand behind these protests. Uh, what's, who are you able to communicate with and, and ensure the adherence to in terms of the Geneva terms? As I mentioned, we have already started with, with the OSC mission, as well as we uh, fully support that this is very important to designate and to get in any uh, high rank representative from Russia as well. Not to blame each other, but to be on the scene and to uh, evaluate the real situation. And what is very important, uh, very important is that the Ukrainian government already uh, asked everybody to stop violence and not to take hostages or any other terrorist activity. The United States and the EU already made several statements, but still there is no single statement from Russia to, on any uh, de-escalation, on any concrete step to implement the Geneva Agreements. No single, uh, even statement from Russia to actually call on separatists to vacate the occupied buildings to again to accept amnesty and to actually start to deweaponize those military people. So I think the first step should be done by every everybody, each side, each party of Geneva Accords. Valentin, we have a set of related questions from Eli Lake at the Daily Beast as well as Warren Strobel at Reuters again. Um, Warren's asking, what is your latest estimate of the Russian troops that are operating uh, along Ukraine's eastern border, have their number, or their disposition changed in recent days according to your assessment? But related to that, Eli Lake is asking, what's the current status of U.S. intelligence sharing with Ukraine? Are you, can, are you satisfied with that level of intelligence sharing? What changes to the intelligence sharing relationship with the U.S. would you like to see? Um, and these are related in part because we've heard U.S. military commanders express concern that their operational view of Russian forces in, uh, on the border may not be the same as, as Ukrainian officials' operational view. Let me start with the last question. Uh, information, intelligence sharing, and even cooperation with our uh, colleagues uh, from the United States are really uh, well uh, organized. We do satisfied with the level of cooperation. It is very intensive. It is very professional, 
and we do feel uh, and uh, and we do get uh, necessary support even not only intelligence sharing and we appreciate many many efforts uh, from the United States government from the Senate from uh, the Congress many delegations and uh, after the negotiations negotiations we have started real real cooperation on security issues in security area that much uh, helps uh, us uh, here in Ukraine not to be alone against really huge and hostile activity of Russian special services, especially uh, when uh, after after Maidan and the crisis, our nations uh, already let's say over or overcame. Plus, what uh, has to be mentioned that uh, local. Uh, authorities in Ukraine, especially in Donetsk and Lugansk Oblast, I think uh, they, as soon as there will be more resources in central, in central government in the budget, they will be getting more support through uh, to maintain normal life. That's not to forget as a main tool to uh, calm, uh, the, calm down the situation there. And the international IMF and other, let's say, uh, aid to Ukraine, which are, let's say, quite uh, quite effectively supported by the United States government and the United and the European Union, is important as well. Here, regarding Russian troops, uh, uh, Damon, the last year, uh, last month and a half, it was many many uh, sleepless nights for me. And many other let's say, officials who are now in charge for uh, in the domestic security and Minister of Defense, uh, because of every night and every day, moving of troops, alarms, uh, alerts, uh, radio communications, provocations at the border, and this uh, that looks really like a terrorizing from the neighbor country, smaller country each day and night, using all possible and even impossible tools and methods, threatening against, uh, again, uh, using, uh, deploying troops, then uh, de-deploying aircrafts, all, all this complexity of issues where simply uh, in Ukraine feel ourselves in uh, constant, if not nightmare, in constant, in constant tense. There is, I can mention several nights when our troops, I mean, Minister of Defense or Border Patrol troops, uh, stayed uh, not in alert. This is simply unaccept unacceptable. Somebody should stop that. Now, on an international level, this is very important, and that was mentioned by Vice President Biden, that finally uh, Kremlin and Russian Federation uh, will stop with, uh, let's say, horrifying and threatening neighbor country by, by all military means and uh, methods. And Valentin, do you also... In Ukraine, if you ask any Ukrainian, did you expect something like that, 99% of Ukrainians will tell you never. This is uh, something uh, which which should be stopped by all international community means. Understood. And, and Valentin, on the troops, do you have your own, does the Ukrainian government have its own assessment of the numbers and disposition of those forces on the border right now? Is that the same? Is it differing from what we're hearing in the press from uh, American and NATO officials? We only we can confirm what NATO officials just uh, released. Up to 40,000 soldiers, around 700 armored vehicles, and 20, uh, 250 aircrafts. Okay. So, can you imagine the, the amount? This is only three uh, main points around the eastern border of, border of Ukraine, near the Donetsk from Rostov, uh, let's say, direction. Uh, near Kharkiv from Belgorod direction and from the south. Three main directions and such a huge amount of troops. This is not uh, taken into consideration the, the, the Russian army, thousand and thousand, ten thousands in, in Crimea Peninsula. This is something uh, really disturbing and really, really uh, dangerous. So let me let me ask a, uh, another question that's coming in from ABC, Ali Weinberg. Um, 
Vice President Biden was there as announced a, a range of uh, assistance. How helpful do you think the additional non-lethal uh, aid announced by the United States will be in combating Russian aggression and whether there are other types of assistance that the U.S. is not providing that might be have more of an impact on the ground? If so, what? Could you repeat, please? It was bad, let's say, connection. Excuse me, Damon. Could you repeat? Right. A question from Ali Weinberg with ABC is about the the non-lethal assistance, uh, military assistance uh, that the United States has announced and is providing to Ukraine. Um, how helpful is that? Uh, what is what's constituted in that? And are there other types of assistance that Ukrainian government would like to see the United States provide right now that could have an impact on the ground? If so, what is that? As I mentioned, Damon, yeah, no, no, no level assistance. That's that's important. Yeah, plus uh, technical assistance. Yes. Financial assistance to the central government. That's uh, not to forget that I think this is among the main, uh, let's say, tool and the main uh, assistance Ukraine uh, really need needs uh, these days. So these three main points to, to be mentioned. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm getting a report as well. I don't know if you have news on that. Uh, two two things coming in that I just wanted to ask you about. Um, we hear a report that Ukrainian uh, military aircraft has been hit by gunfire over the eastern city of Slavonsk, according to a Reuters report that's just out. And we're also hearing that a journalist from the news outlet uh, Vice, I believe, um, Simon Ostrovsky, has been captured in eastern Ukraine. Um, uh, I'm just, I don't know if these have come across your radar screen yet, but it sounds as if there's potential for uh, a uh, escalation, uh, an outbreak over particular incidents. Do you know about these particular incidents? Is there something you can share? Uh, if not, how concerned are you that one one incident like this could lead to a quite a rapid escalation? Yes, I know about these accidents. Uh, the escalation, as uh, we have mentioned, uh, continues to to get to 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 rise. There is no doubt on that. What we have, what we uh, see in in Ukraine and in Donetsk Oblast, we understand that those armed people, especially those uh, military people, uh, using uh, uh, rifles and uh, guns and uh, all weapons, they capture it, not even think in the moment. So they shoot, they provoking. They simply continue to, ter to terrorize the uh, local communities. They really shoot on any aircraft or helicopter who is, uh, which could be the, at the area, even those uh, non-military. So this is true. What about uh, uh, as, as regard to the hostages and those captured people, journalists as well? Yes, uh, these criminals in uh, Donetsk Oblast in Slavyansk Today, capture it uh, and uh, took uh, hostages. Among them, militia uh, head of local militia from Kramatorsk, and now being uh, let's say captured by them, as well as a local prosecutor, as well as uh, uh, two uh, journalists. So they continue to terrorize us, and that is why we don't see any other uh, let's say mean. To uh, just to renew the counter-terrorist uh, operation on the ground and to to continue to isolate them, armored people from uh, other cities, from uh, other let's say infrastructure of Ukraine, and then to reinforce our efforts, our efforts to block and to to to, to actually isolate those organizers. That's what we have for this moment. Okay, let me ask you, related to that, there's a question came in from Keith Hill at Bloomberg about, in light of, of articles mentioning that Ukraine's armed forces themselves lack training, uh, the surrender of six APCs to pro-Russian militants, the issue of uh, whether it's corruption or, or even penetration, subversion of the forces. Um, two questions related to that. Keith is asking, Shouldn't the United States and NATO be hesitant in sending advanced weapons to Ukraine right now uh, when there is uncertainty about the cap capacity of the forces themselves? 
But related to that, what forces can you rely on as you think about counterterrorist operations in the East, um, from local police to the SBU forces themselves to the military? This is complicated as you're using uh, using uh, security ministries on the territory of Ukraine. Actually, uh, again, on the counter-terrorist operation, according to the law in Ukraine, this uh, mainly, uh, especially as I mentioned to you, to block the city, to make a circle for terrorists not to uh, come out from uh, Slovyansk. This is quite enough, uh, let's say, uh, troops from Ministry of Interior there, uh, as well as a special uh, unit from SBU, counter-terrorist unit, and some military support. But for us, clearly to, dis to distinguish what actually we uh, we do, and not to uh, be involved in any uh, shooting or any military activity against civil population. Again, there are many uh, many people there, local community, civil people who are still in the city, and those uh, organizers simply hiding uh, behind them, behind uh, women, children. So this is their main shield to avoid and to protect themselves from our counter-terrorist uh, efforts. This is to understand. That is why more weapons, more military activity is not the uh, right answer so far. right answer is, again, to work especially with local communities, providing them with real information and to get them at our side. To not to tolerate those criminals and not to protect them, not to stand between us and them, I mean the criminals. Let us, I mean uh, central authorities, security service, Ministry of Interior, to protect local communities from those uh, armed criminals and terrorists. This is the main point, Damon, to understand the, the, the what for today and for this night is the main uh, task of all law enforcement and security uh, bodies in Ukraine. If, we, if you would excuse me, I have to <laughs> to, 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 to finish on uh, our communication for, for today, but thank you for this possibility. It was my pleasure to see you, to hear you, and to work with you. Thank you very much, Valentin. We know you're in the midst of a crisis, and we know your schedule is going to be truncated. So thank you uh, thank for you giving this time and uh, when you do find your way to Washington we look forward to welcoming you here. Let me thank all of our viewers that have been online and asked questions. We have more questions of course. I apologize if we couldn't get to them uh, but we will also be putting excerpts of uh, this report, this interview uh, out more broadly. Thank you very much.